All right, so uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dana Hansen. He's uh, with NC State, and he's the Extension Meat Specialist there. And um, we've known Dana for a long, long time and uh, respect him as a very knowledgeable person about what goes on in the curing of meats uh, from beginning to end. And we thought it'd be interesting to have him on our podcast today to talk about what is actually going on with country curing of meats, what we do for a living, and uh, uh, really understanding the science behind why uh, we can take a, a piece of fresh meat and turn it into something that tastes great and has a great shelf life. Very and good. Dana, if you don't mind, if, if you would, tell them just a, a little bit about yourself and uh, kind of you know, my, why, my, el why my elevator why, speech. Yeah, why we call you the Dana Fauci Hansen of. <laughs> well, um, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. I, I uh, ran across your all's podcast, I don't know, weeks ago, months ago, and thought, man, that's really a pretty innovative way to get a message out and uh, talk to customers and, 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 and get information out to, to different folks that have interest in the meat business. So um, kudos to you guys for, for using this kind of source of media or this, this, uh, this uh, type of media. Cause I think it's kind of a, it's an interesting way to do, to get in touch with people in these challenging times as, as we've used that term probably at nauseum. Right. But um, a little bit about myself. I, I'm like you said, I'm at NC state or at North Carolina state university. And I, I work within the Department of Food, Bioprocessing, and Nutrition Sciences, which is this large building on campus where we've got about uh, all total, we've got about 400 students that uh, are studying those majors, whether it be bioprocessing or food science or nutrition. Um, and I'm one of about 25 faculty in that department that have a role with, within that, that larger group. And my specific role is outreach and teaching. So I, I teach undergraduate and graduate courses, but then I, my outreach portion is working with the food industry, but specifically with meat. So uh, large and small processors and literally soup to nuts, um, you know, from, from food safety issues to new product development, uh, uh, just kind of the the person at NC State that deals with, with muscle foods is <laughs> you know, a thumbnail sketch of what I do. So um, and I've been there, you say a long time. I can't, I can't, it, it, it hurts my feelings when I think about how long I've been there. Cause then I know how many years I have to add on to my, you know, my age every, but been here about, uh, 18 years or, um, uh, going on 19 years. So, um, can't claim to be the new guy anymore. Yeah. Well, I'm so old. I remember when you were the new guy and young, so yeah, really, yeah, young, really, really young, the new guy. Nice, nice, nice. But, uh, so you just want to kind of go through the step-by-step -step process of why food yeah, or, just, or what curing is and, and food as a food preservation method and, and what goes yeah. into that detail, huh? Yeah. I mean, just from the standpoint of we buy fresh meat, we put it in, um, again, the brief thumbnail overview, we put it in salt. We use, in our case, we use sodium nitrate. Others use other ingredients, but salt right. and sodium nitrate. And then we wash that salt off. We put it in, in a room that's springtime temperatures and humidities. And then we go from right. there, smoke it, and then we age it. And then the end result we hope is a great flavored ham that's shelf stable. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, I, I think it's important to maybe give people a perspective of what curing is or from a standpoint of how it's come to be. And um, I always like to start this discussion with history. I, I tell people if I wouldn't have done meat science, I would have, I think history is a pretty interesting area of study too. Um, but you know, we, the, the idea of curing is really, it's a term we use for, for, for a style of food preservation and, you know, we preservatives get kind of a bad rap or, or at least are not, that terminology is not real, is not held in real high regard right now. But the reality is we've, we've been preserving or, uh, extending shelf life maybe is a little more, uh, uh, easy term or a little softer term but we've been doing that with foods for for centuries and this idea of of adding salt to raw meat to use it at a different or a later date has been around i um, mean there's records that go back uh three four thousand bc uh some cult early cultures the greeks were real um innovative or at least they they probably were better record keepers than a lot of folks and so there's 
there's records that go back to the Greeks. There's records that go back to the Romans where they use salt and buried product or buried raw meat and, and then came back and consumed it at a later time. So historically it goes back, you know, his early historical record, right? Um, so what happens or why it works or why salt is such an important ingredient is that particularly sodium chloride, it's natural, right? I mean, it was one of those things. I don't know that early man set out and and decided that, oh, that white stuff that either I evaporate out of seawater works really well or deposits that they found in in the earth. Um, but they they anthropologists kind of have come to the conclusion that it was a way to actually hide their 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 early 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 like nomadic tribes that moved around and you know they were hunter gatherer type they would bury their products in in the ground and you know i can just imagine the first time that they buried it and then they forgot where they put it right or the the other, the other issue they they figured out man this this product is is it's still good, right? I mean, after they, they forgot, maybe they found it again later and found out, ah, oh, here, it, there's something about this soil or this spot that works. So that's kind of where they, they think that the salt use kind of came to be. And what really is going on is that the salt is pulling moisture out of that raw meat. And, and moisture is one of the um, major requirements that bacteria need or require to, to grow. And bacteria are a big part of what causes spoilage. And so we're trying to prevent or um, eliminate this, this spoilage due to, to bacteria. So salt has worked real well with that. It's really a function of pulling water out of, out of a meat system. And, you know, to go down the rabbit hole, like, like Keith said, you know, meat is a very high water food system. You know, when we think about foods that, as food scientists nerds we think of them as systems right and how we manipulate the system and meat is a uh, about 75 percent water so this high water content is very conducive to to bacterial um spoilage or it's bacteria can use it as a readily use it as a food source so it's got water it's got all the micronutrients uh, I and mean, there's there's a lot going on in meat that make it a almost ideal media for bacteria growth so Salt is a huge deal. Salt pres preservation through salt is a huge, not only historic, but now we've brought it into modern times. We still rely on it, right? A lot of people think that salt is really just put into products from a taste standpoint. Um, you know, we put it on potato chips and it's kind of that salty thing that get us, you know, we have a some craving sometimes for that salty um, taste. And it's one of the five basic tastes that we're able to detect with our tongue, but it goes well beyond just a, um, a sensory standpoint, it really has, uh, it's deep rooted in its preservation effect. You know, you just start talking about the salt and how it came to be. I'm just, I don't want to go down off the track too far, but you know, we found certain kind of salt seem to cure meat better than others. Um, and, and feel like some salts, believe it or not, taste the, makes the meat taste saltier than Tastes others. Different, yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, so we're, you know, leaning on one or two types that we like to use. And when we deviate, um, we paid the price of the meat coming out too salty is mm -hmm. for the same amount of time and salt for the weight range that the hams are in. Um, and in some cases, the problem is not just that the salt doesn't take fast. It doesn't take fast enough. So we end up uh, with a higher spoilage rate. And sometimes it's because it's granulated and it rolls off the ham and doesn't stay on the ham or it caves. Right. Um, right. Right. But that, you know, that's, that's more about the process itself and things that's things that we've learned over 94 years. I'm not sure about the science. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, and I'm sure you're going to get to it, but what, what happens besides the fact you're pulling the moisture out, but what, what creates that, flavor profile that we get in a country ham that twang that we get the fermentation the conversion of the the meat flavor from a fresh to a to a fermented right twangy flavor you know it's it's uh dry cured products are really kind of a perfect storm of a lot of different events that are going on in that system so salting from is from the at the very we'll kind of go through all the major components as we as we produce hams or country hams. 
So the salt comes into the system. Obviously, we're going to get that that flavor profile or a predominant salt back note or you know front note, I guess it should say. But what another important ingredient that contributes to flavor that is um, part of most cure um, mixes is is either sodium nitrate or sodium nitrite. All right. Now, chemically, those two things are different. Sodium nitrate is NaNO3, and then nitrate is a reduction of that chemical, so it's NaNO2. And so, from a chemical standpoint, they're they're very similar, but they're in in the in his historical background, we've used both, or the dry cure industry has used both. But really, their function is to work synergistic, synergistically with salt to create this this thing that we call a cured meat. All right, and really that those ingredients coming together, they do four things for us, right? They do, they, they're, a, they're a powerful antimicrobial, which that's, we'll, we'll come back to that potentially, but but we got to mention it's one of the major four things that nitrate does is it it, it preserves the product, but it, it inhibits the growth, growth of Clostridium botulinum, which is a major uh, pathogen that we are concerned with, with, with cured meats or particularly vacuum packaged cured meats. Um, it gives us the traditional color that we see in, in cured products. So the pink color that we associate with ham or cured bacon or anything that's been, um, you know, have those ingredients addition, we, that we associate that with that product. And that's, that is due to the reaction that nitrite has with another component that we haven't talked about, but a a protein that's found in meat that's called myoglobin. And myoglobin is a protein that's found in all muscle tissue at varying degrees based on species. Pork has a little, has myoglobin. Beef has more myoglobin. That's why it looks darker red. Poultry has myoglobin, but it has less per volume. So that's why poultry looks lighter colored. All right. But the reaction that that nitrite has with myoglobin gives us this, we say it fixes the color, right? Or it makes a, fixes the cured color that we desire, that pink color. And then the other thing that it does is that it, and these two things kind of work together. It changes the flavor and it, and it, and it acts as an antioxidant as well. So uh, nitrite prevents lipid oxidation or fat uh, be, becoming oxidized and creating flavors that are undesirable. And when I say undesirable, I, I mean uh, rancid flavors. We describe oxidation as rancidity. And so the cure prevents some of that going on during long-term storage or production. In this case, country ham taking 80, 90, 100, 200 days, whatever that timeline is, there's lots of opportunity for that fat to, to go south quite, quite honestly or, or to become oxidized. So cure helps slow that reaction down. And then that ties into this overall flavor profile that we see with cured meats. We can all kind of agree that country ham tastes different than fresh pork roast. We can kind of all agree that, you know, bacon tastes different than, you know, cured bacon tastes different than fresh belly. And, and that, that largely is due to, to again, these, this cure ingredient. So back kind of to your original question, what's going on? I mean, that's so that's part of it, salt. Now we've got cure. Now the other component that makes re, that's really unique from a flavor development standpoint in this dry cured product that we know is country ham. And I don't have you thrown have you thrown out to the audience the difference between country ham and city ham? You know, when we yep. when, when yep. we use that jargon, you know, I got to kind of be sure that I'm clear that everybody yep. knows where I'm coming from. Yep. No, we so city, about that. So city ham also has those ingredients salt and nitrite and a lot of times there's water that's added to that product which is another story for another day we'll 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 save that but um flavor profile is 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 much different and that's a much quicker cure right you can turn over city hams from start to finish in some of these large operations that are that are doing commercial product that you know you may find at retail wherever okay i mean you can literally from raw product to product in a box you can do it in about a time frame of 24 hours, right? I mean, if the machine's turning the way it's supposed to and everything's working the way it's supposed to. I mean, that's a very realistic timeline. From a standpoint in country ham, about as fast as you can produce them is about 70 days, 80 days. 
but it's very common to have 100 plus 200 you know really long aged matured hands you know that's a that's a significant significant difference so there's chemically there's a lot of things that are going on in that time that the ham is aging and the two big things that are going on there's there's breakdown now i i i think we're all we can we're, we can we can get with this now i'm going to use the word controlled spoilage okay i'm not i'm not i'm not trying to to um suggest that country hams are spoiled meat but it's a controlled breakdown really what we're doing when we're maturing product is we're preventing spoilage but we're controlling it so it doesn't get to a point where the sensory characteristics are negative we're we're manipulating it so they're actually desirable flavors but the breakdown or what's happening is we we have a process called proteolysis and we have a process called lipolysis and so if we break those words down protein proteolysis pro we're breaking down protein and we're breaking down the other side, we're breaking down lipids. Lipolysis, we break down lipids. And so when we take all these things, these, so proteins are these long chains of amino acids that are all tied together, are all bound together. When we go through proteolysis, we cleave those proteins and we produce a little small chain, what we refer to as peptides. And those peptides oftentimes give us different flavor components when we heat it or cook it or whatever. It gives us, there's some of them that give us some aromas. They give us some different flavor components when we go ahead and then consume the product. Different than it was if it was just 24-hour made city ham, right? It needs time is really the magic or time is the variable that, that goes into that equation that creates these very cool flavors. And the same can be said with lipolysis, except it's a little different. We're not dealing with protein. We're dealing with fats. But we're breaking down the fatty acid chains on of of these uh, triglycerides, and those again, unique flavor compounds, volatile compounds creating aromas that we can detect. Okay, so that's really the big thing is this this time factor that we fact that we create or that we add into dry cured meats to give us the development. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So we did a, a couple things come to mind when you're talking about this, that, that in the aging process, um, once a ham reaches about um, somewhere around six to nine months, depending on the, the temperature ranges, right. the humidities and so forth, um, a uh, flex, we call them age flex, that, that right. develop throughout the lean meat. Um, but it's a way of telling, too, that the ham was aged correctly. And we use that as a sign of, oh, this ham's going to taste, you know, the right way. Right. Um, um, and we go to food shows in, uh, around the country. And when Europeans from Spain and Italy walk up and they see our product on display, they're not used to seeing European or U.S. made product th that has that because right. there's, not, there's not that many people um, aging product that long to get those flex, but they understand what that means. What that is, because right. What that is, and, and, and that you're not going to get that unless you age a ham the right way and long enough. I mean, we're targeting, a, let me back that up. There are people that age hams for 70 days because they're targeting a certain flavor profile. There are people that age them four months, six months, you know, nine months and so on. We're, some of our hams were aging up to two years. So we know what, we sell them all in different flavor profiles based on the age. We just want to be consistent in that flavor profile. And for us to understand uh, what's going on, um, we have to measure the end result of the product, whether it's water activity or cutting into these hams of these lots at certain times and seeing those flex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My question is, what are those flex? What what happened? What caused those flex? And, I, and some people will say, "Oh, that's salt." Right. I, I don't think so. That's all. So what you're referring to, and this is, and you'll see this again. I'm glad you mentioned the the European style. So, um, and I'm sure the audience is is up to speed on that. So the country ham's cousin, right? I like to make fun of it a little bit. Country ham's re we're we're cousins to things over the ocean, like prosciutto in Italy or Serrano or Iberico style hams that we see in Spain. And I like to say, you know, country ham is, we're, we're the redneck cousin, right? I mean, we're the ones that 
live across right. the ocean, right? But you know, very common for for Iberian ham that is that is made. Actually, it's made in a lot of throughout Spain, but traditionally, the real high quality Iberian hams are made in kind of southern Spain, um, where a specific breed of pig is fed a specific diet. And that specific diet is made up of acorns. And that acorn as a feedstuff contributes some very unique things to the flavor profile of the ham, primarily because it changes the fat profile or the fatty acid profile in how that pig is, or the fat that that pig lays down while it's in its finishing phase. But none, and we'll kind of come back to that. But the the other unique thing about those types of hams is that once they are cured, they go through a very similar curing process as a country ham, almost identical, in fact. I mean, so the the ingredients, the cure ingredients, the salt, and in some cases nitrite. The Spanish tend to use nitrite. The Italians tend not to, at least in a pure addition. There's some nitrite that's likely there as a contaminant in some of the salts that they use, but nonetheless. Right. There's there's nitrite that is in that in that Spanish product, so they're curing it. They bury the ham in salt for a number of weeks, take it out, and go through the drying process. But the maturing process is three years for a for a, a high end high quality Iberian ham. It's a minimum of a three year process. You know, 100 percent or near 100 percent diet of acorns. That's how they rank them or how they divide them up in quality standpoint. But the higher the amount of acorn, and then the longer the aging time is an in, is indicative of quality so in those real high in high quality iberian hams you slice them open and you'll see these little white crystals that are kind of embedded throughout that slice face and what that is is an it's an amino acid uh most of the time it's an amino acid known as tyrosine and so tyrosine over time will precipitate out of that system and there's a lot of theory on how and why and it's not B believe it or not, over the thousands of years of curing ham, it's not very well understood. Um, kind of the conventional wis wisdom is, is that with the addition of salt in that system, it helps. There's a terminology that we use, it salts out or salting out of the amino acids and it brings them, it creates a precipitator. So it, it, it concentrates it and then we see that amino acid crystallize in those locations throughout the slice. And so when you bite into them, you, you know, you really don't perceive anything from a flavor standpoint, but what they are is a good visual gauge of how long that that product is aged because it doesn't happen overnight, right? You can't get crystals to form in a 70 day ham or 80, I mean, even a hundred day ham. I and mean, you've got to have a lot of time. So a function of the salt and the amount of moisture loss and all those things to precipitate those, that specific amino acid out. And you see similar things in different food products and the foodies, can kind of get with this. You'll see this in cheese. You'll see it in mm -hmm. things like uh, yep. Parmesan cheese as well. And it's a similar type of process. I mean, it's a similar result anyway of that aging and those, that, that salting out of those amino acids. You actually get, when I eat Parmesan or Parmesan cheese, for instance, or any Parmesan cheese, I get the same uh, uh, bite. I don't want to say bite. Mm -hmm fermented flavor as I do in, in a long aged ham that we make right um, on the side of my tongue when I eat it. It's, it, it's again, I call it the fermented flavor that we get um, a controlled ferment mm -hmm. um, is I like that. That, that or, term. or a lot of those, those components, those peptides that are, that are produced, they give that perception of a really intense um, umami flavor profile. Umami is a is one of the five basic tastes. So we talk about base taste. We've got salty, we've got sweet, we've got sour, we have bitter, and we have umami, which is that savory. Yep. Full mouth is actually how it's described. Yeah. Or it it, it gives a it gives your mouth that feeling of fullness along the tongue. So. Salt and umami bomb with those intensely aged hams. Yep. Keith, Keith, uh, and Sammy and I went on a ham tasting tour across and you the didn't, country. Wait, 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 wait! Hold on, hold on! You're telling me this now. You're telling yeah. me this now. You're yeah. hurting my feelings. You went on a ham tasting <laughs> tour, and probably yeah. had to drive through Raleigh. Uh, no, it was more on no, no, yeah, no. We <laughs> actually, we, we actually did one in Brooklyn, one 
Oh, okay. You went to the direction. It's just going one in Napa. And by the end, we had looked at 17 dry curd long aged hams from around the world and actually you're, have a flavor you're, wheel that was put together. You're, you're kidding. And we, it was a blind. We, we, well, we didn't say this is the ham. It was like, here's, here's the ham. Write down your notes, your tasting notes. Right. Blind. It wasn't about who's better, who's worse, which is the, you know, which is the tastiest. Right. And, and we got a lot of these flavor profiles. Um, you developed you know, your Sam, own lexicon, huh? Your yeah, well, it, exactly. You know, and, and Sam uses country twang, and, and that's where, uh, you know, it, it took me a while, but I, I got Sam to agree that funk is an acceptable culinary term in our <laughs> world. Funk. And it did actually show up quite a bit uh, in this thing. Now, you know, you did make those. I, I'll, I'll be down in a... Palmetto Bluff actually doing four different hams in another few weeks mm -hmm. at an event down there. So this is this is pure gold. One of them is actually the history of ham. So what you're giving me today is is pure gold. I knew some of this, but oh, right. again, yeah, this is this is fantastic. But yeah, the ham tastings, and we'll we'll get you a copy. I'll send yeah, you a copy of the, so. uh, yeah, the, 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 the tasting. Uh, uh, the ham tasting wheel is what we refer to it as. Um, uh, the um, umami. Uh, so, so we charted again, we had everything from multiple country hams to, uh, multiple Spanish hams, Italian hams, uh, some domestic, some imported, uh, in these tastings. And we asked them to compare them in taste. And there's definitely some similarities between, um, I mean, of course, we were really interested in how ours tested against all of them, but mm -hmm. it was really umami was one of them that ours tested similarly. Correct me if I'm wrong, Keith, but to the European uh, style hams. Oh uh, no, absolutely. I mean, we're we're our younger country ham, you know, because we do a, a 30 day country ham, and I always refer to that oh, to having more of a. Or sorry, 90 day, 90 day. Uh, I always refer to that as having more of a sea air briny kind of a salt hit Salty. to it when, when yeah, yeah when, well but not the nine volt battery because of the way that we do them you know the 70 day hams that i've tried out there you, i was you, know, you may as well stick your tongue on a nine volt battery it just lights me up to a point where it's just <laughs> not pleasant by the time you know with between the salt the cure room and then for us i think it's absolutely huge going into equalization for three weeks to let that cure balance out equalize for me, it almost mellows that salt hit a little bit in the younger country ham that we do. But by the time we go to a nine to 11 month age with the wigwam, by the time we go to 18 months to two years with the heritage breed, domestic hogs, um, for me, you know, I actually use the Parmesan cheese. You know, like the wigwam is almost more the rind of the Parmesan cheese salt hit. When you get to the mm -hmm. 18 month age, it's like taken right out of the core of a 50 pound wheel of parm. It, it's where you get that combination of, of umami and salt. And, you know, it, it, it don't, for me, I call it ham flavored butter, you know, cause it <laughs> gives you that feel with that mellower salt on the hit. So it's, uh, and, and we did, I mean, we were right there on the flavor profile cut uh, comparing against um, the, the really the Hamon Iberico as opposed, you know, the, the real prosciuttos, yeah, they were right there. We actually had a prosciutto from Tuscany where their cure right. recipe is a little bit different. And even, you know, so within one, just like here where different smokehouses have different flavor profiles, it was really kind of cool to see even within Spain, we had two Iberico, two Iberico Bayota. From Italy, we had a, a nine month age parm that you can, you know, you go out and you get it in any grocery store and it's just, it is not much to it, really not much flavor. The Tuscan, because of the cure recipe, the actual salt combined with spices versus the real prosciutto coming out uh, of the Parma region and the diet with the pigs and everything else. But we were our Suriano. We actually had some peanut fed, some of our peanut fed limited release Suriano. And that even between our traditional Suriano to the peanut fed to how it all linked up with, say, just an Iberico hog versus the acorn fed Iberico Beota. But we were right in line with with those, which was, you know, and some people thought we were crazy. They said, why are you out here touting your competition? It's like, this isn't about competition. This is about education. Mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's really where, you know, we're thrilled to have you on today. That it so, can go side by side and still be in the right. same. Right. And, oh, and also getting, getting the 
uh, people in the U.S. to recognize that people in the, in the U.S. that can make product that's acceptable, that they're paying <laughs> crazy yeah, uh, yeah. yeah uh, numbers to, to, to buy. And we, we just feel like um, I think the country am industry, I hope, is going to recognize that, too. As long as we can get past certain hurdles with the USDA to allow us to continue to make that product. Um, oh, sure. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what the future holds. Yeah, I, th I think you've you've kind of you've keyed in or I've, I'm hearing kind of another central theme that, that I think is important to talk about that. Um, may or well, I mean, it, it does have a huge impact and I is the diet of the pig and, you know, the, of the product then ultimately that that pig is able to produce. Right. Um, you know, the importance of acorns in a, in a biota or, you know, in the Iberian ham or the, the acorn biota, right. The acorn itself is such a integral part of what makes that, that product, what it is. Right. I mean, and I, I'll be really honest. I mean, I, as a, as a scientist, I'm somewhat skeptical until you show me, right? I mean, and and in the United States, not coming up in a, I mean, I'm a Midwestern kid. I didn't grow up in a Spanish household where that was a food culture that I was experienced, you know, that I, I experienced bratwurst and cheese in Wisconsin. That was my food culture. You know, I had to come to North Carolina to really get exposed to dry cured hams from an American side. But then that brought me into this realm of, hey, look over the fence and see what really it's how it started in Europe. And until we really get to truly understand that food system, man, it, it re, the feed is really important. And the times I've traveled to Spain to see, I mean, it is when you can put side by side. So a Serrano ham, which is kind of their commodity ham in Spain, and the commodity, you know, come out, so that's that's a little bit tongue in cheek to say that Serrano is a commodity food product, but in you know, in those parts of the world, it yeah. truly is very common right. and it's a commodity, sold as a commodity. And it's a it's got it's kind of like the 70 day year old, 70 day old country ham equivalency, you know, as far as how we would view it. But it is night and day. I mean, it is the the fatty acid profile is so important for developing flavors. I um it's and the literature would support that too a lot of the work that's come out of europe or come out of spain particularly that hey this is this is how you get the magic is the a lot what the pig eats yeah well we're we're doing uh, an iberico now in texas uh this raised on acorns and mesquite berries beans and, yep yeah mesquite beans and all that yep um yep. It, it definitely imparts a different flavor profile in the fresh pork um, which is rich. I mean, mm -hmm. it's rich, fresh. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, it's got to, it's got to transfer into the cured product. We're just now releasing some of that product. We we now realize we're going to have to change some of our curing steps um, to accommodate. So I'm, I got a question for you. So because the Iberico breed has so much fat in it, right? I mean, it's just marbled all through that lean meat. Right. Can we cut back on the salt? Time in salt. Um, Cuz I mean the moisture in that ham comes is, out quick. Is less, yeah. I I would suspect. I mean I I think that would obviously we'd have to take some time to to measure that and see. I mean ultimately the water activity would is what we'd have to manage, but you may get to a target water activity with less volume of salt. Yeah, I can, I can yeah. see that, but I mean, what I, that, what that combination of days in salt and amount would be, I, I don't know how we would. I think, I think by shortening the days in salt and lengthening, still keep the same number of days, maybe in salt and equalization. Yeah. Cause I know that that's what they do in Europe. They've pretty much got the same number of days in salt and equalization. Yeah, it's, but, it's actually but they, really short. I mean, the, the yeah. plants that we toured through a couple of years ago when we went with yeah. the Country Ham Association, I mean, they're, I go back and look at my notes, but I mean, it's like two weeks in salt. But in, well, one you know, of them, one of them that I got notes from, I went with a guy that imports Spanish foods. One of them, they left their hams in salt for 12 days. 
in yeah, salt 12, 12 days. Yeah. But real they, coarse it, ground, kind of yeah, yeah. kind of looked like rocks. It was like ice cream meta, salt. Yeah, on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mediterranean Mediterranean sea salt. Right. But but what was you know, it's makes sense. They just let them hang in equalization longer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The springtime was longer. Yeah, they weren't and, they're not in a in a race to get products done, right? So I mean Yeah. Whatever it takes. Yeah. But that equalization, I think the salt that did absorb on the surface, and maybe because of all the fat content that they have. And that that rock salt that they use mm -hmm. turns turns the liquid really quick. As a matter of fact, they they pre treat the salt by allowing a little bit of water. Salt. Well, no, they they let it sit in that cooler with the natural humidity that's in the air, and it starts to melt on it. You don't put fresh salt right out of the dry, bag. dry, dry, yeah, dry yeah. salt. Right. You put you put it. Of course, they get to continue to reuse that salt over and over and over again, right. which already has the moisture from the previous load of hands, which right. the USDA here would so far has not uh, allowed that to go. They yeah, don't. Yeah. They make a yeah, I mean, it's similar, similar in Italy as well. I mean, they'll, they'll put water in that salt as well or just mm -hmm. to make kind of a paste if any if you would you know if you yeah. think of a paste yeah. I, I think a lot of it also has to do with at least in spain how they prep the ham from a from a trimming standpoint if you they take a lot of skin off of those those hams so there's more there's more surface area for that that salt to have contact yeah the ones that i saw in it in spain um it was just on the back side. They had maybe about a six inch collar the way they trimmed it. Um, it still had a lot of skin on the back, but the mm -hmm. ones that we were doing, there's no salt. This skin's all the way down the back. And in the first batches that we did leaving them in salt, the time that we normally leave, I felt like they came out a little too salty, too salty. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to cut back on the days in salt based on the weight. Um, so to, to one other thing I want you to touch on. So what we've learned because of our fire and curing hams in different facilities, according to our, our recipe, mm -hmm. if assuming and best we can tell they're following our recipe, you know, as close as they, you know, they say they are, um, the, the impact of their flora and their, uh, terroir is significant, much more significant than I expected. Now we had one ham house that I met. I mean, I was stunned at how close they came to the flavor profile that we were producing in Surrey. Hmm. And the rest of them are just significantly different. Just, just in the, the flavor and the texture, the smell, mm -hmm. uh, in their, their aging rooms and, and, uh, and it, I just didn't expect that to be that that different. Now my nose is super sensitive to the way I think that should be or smell. Right. right. Um, I'm not. I don't know if the average consumer could pick that up, but it certainly has made an impact to me uh, as to how much different that would be. You gotta develop. You gotta need. You need to develop your own uh, starter culture. You know, figure out what the what that flora is. Well, or what yeah, well, you know, we actually at one point, Sam and I, Sam, Sam was thinking about, you know, doing some stuff without using nitrate nitrite, which means uh -huh. you have to introduce a starter culture of some sort, which in there. So now and basically we have two different I mean, good bacteria floating around that are going to help create that fermentation that we're looking for. So do, doesn't every smokehouse kind of have its own unique terroir with, you know, beyond time or temperature, humidity, weather patterns within the region. But as far as within each smokehouse, their own unique personality. Or bacteria. Yeah, personality. Very, there, there you go. <laughs> yeah, very likely. I mean, and that's, I mean, you're particularly in, in the systems that we're talking about with dry cured products. I, I would totally prescribe to that, that the culture <laughs> The, the bacteria culture that develops on those products as they mature is going to be unique. Um, again, another food plant that's not doing a dry cure product where it's matured, you don't want any culture, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
go with that at all. But it, uh, you know, sanitation is such that you want to devoid of of bacteria. But when you're maturing things, yeah, there is some um, very legitimate surface ripening that is due to or the bacterial growth, right? I mean, there's and there's actually, I mean, there's commercial cultures that are available that do that. I mean, that help enhance color and flavor and aroma and all those things um you know so there are there are there are species there are known species that will contribute to that now we just we don't necessarily we don't know that oh, is that is that i don't know how to describe this but the same type of things going on in a in a someone's whether they're in western kentucky or tennessee or virginia or north carolina there's you're going to have some unique flora in those aging rooms let me ask you a question. So taking our, cons our concerns, which is, you know, our smokehouses burn to the ground. Mm -hmm. We build new smokehouses and aging rooms and processing areas. And especially in the aging rooms that we're curing these or aging these hams. Yeah. We have hams still from pre-fire that have been put in deep chill. Mm -hmm. so they don't continue to age, mm -hmm. but they've, they've, I, you know, every once in a while, we got plenty of them. So I'm every once in a while, I'll pull one out and taste it. And it, it, it strikes me as a, wow, I forget. I'm, I'm, it's concerning me that I'm forgetting what that flavor profile was, but I taste <laughs> it and I go, Oh, there it is. I remember now, but my, you mentioned about recreating that culture. Mm -hmm. So I could theoretically take that ham, one of those hands and, and somebody could replicate that theoretically and i could what do they do turn it into a a mist and i walk through the plant and spray it all over the place and recontaminate not contaminate but re inoculate re inoculate dr fauci uh my my plant to make that our bacteria the predominant um in the new plant because i know that i mean i've heard this I, before uh, new plants can lose their personality yeah yeah you know um, i i think there's a couple things going on i mean what what i would explore I mean, certainly the culture or that back you know that microflora would certainly be a contributing factor and so you know the the process oversimplified i mean you could take that and you could enumerate what those organisms are on the surface and determine i mean there's going to be many <laughs> there's going to be a lot and so now determining which one of those or which any number of those are truly the ones that contribute the flavors that you want that's going to be the difficult thing because you i mean there's going to be you're going to have a list as long as your right arm is what flora is there mm. so what what really has the biggest impact okay the the flavor profile though i i mean i it's going to be very it's going to be very confounded based on again the pig what it ate the ingredients it used to cure how long you aged it the environment that it was aged in and yeah. what the what those products of proteolysis are and those products of lipolysis are but there's tools that you could use from a analytic standpoint too to determine what percentage there and tie that to consumer sensibility right run it on a gc mass spec or whatever you could totally pull that flavor profile apart and say all right this funk note on the wheel here in the upper right hand corner is due to da, 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 whatever that you know you can you could tie that you could use sensory analysis to try to get at what flavor gives the note that you want maybe you don't want funk maybe you want more funk but you see where i'm going that's that's yeah that's fairly in in involved science but you can do it and the bacteria flora would be part of that yeah no i'm thinking about just grinding a ham up and then just smearing it all over the walls okay. i thought it was gonna be yeah, you don't want to do you don't want to do that it's not <laughs> it's um i mean because you got to think about how the hams come in contact you know you're not curing hams on the wall yeah right well, i mean spreads. it's it spreads it's oh. it's got to be um i mean you could hey. do it um you know the, the the approach is and there and again this is another product but i mean the the approach is to do it at salting or at the time that you're putting them in a net or that's when you'd put the 
culture on is is you yeah. put it put the culture in a net and maybe hang them then so there's direct contact with the surface. I mean, there that'd be some kind of fun playing around on how that would how that might impact. Well, it. I'm kind of I'm sort of kind of hoping that we it, called it, it back slopping in the day. Sam. Yes, we don't. We don't yep. mess, no, we don't, I, hey, we're, we're trying to put that one out of our vocabulary. That one doesn't sell too well. Well, in the good old days when we used piston stuffers to make sausage, yes, uh, there was enough residual. Even yes. though you could you could clean a piston stuffer ten times in a row, there's still going to be some biofilm left <laughs> on the inside of it, that stuffer. What, but what that, happened? That is what, what carried that fermented flavor over and over and over and over again. Then when we started buying these Hauntman all stainless steel, you can sterilize those suckers down to the nth degree. We started losing some of that that yeah. stuff, yeah. that the, yeah. the stuff that made it. Now, eventually it did ferment, but it took instead of a week to get that flavor profile, it would take three and four weeks to get that. I call it the Lebanon bologna. Kick. Yes. Yes. And hey, the Lebanon bologna, Seltzer's Lebanon bologna. I mean, like the king of Lebanon bologna. In, yep, yep. Le I mean, that is I'm, a. I'm a fan. I'm a big that's fan. a culture. That is a, the, at least the way I understand it, that is unique to that entity. I mean, and that was kind of their own culture that they developed because it was this. They liked their funk, right? Yeah. Right. Well, that's not a that's not a good word. Funk's not a good word. But. <laughs> Unique uh, flavor profile. So, what happened? What happened to the to the antique stuffer? I mean, is it? It's it's gone. Uh, yeah, I think went that to the, U, went, USDA happened to the old stuffer. Oh, unfortunately, even before the fire. <laughs> yeah, the the cast the, the yeah. coolest piece yeah. of equipment I'd ever seen in my life. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> antique cast thing. Yeah, five hundred pound uh, piston stuffer, meaning you could put five hundred pounds of sausage in at a time. You didn't put it in your front yard and put like petunias in it or anything cool. I should have used it for a boat anchor. I mean, man, um, you, you should know, have put that anchor. in front of the building as a sign. That could have been your new logo. I mean, that is, oh my lord! I didn't tell you, I didn't tell you that story. I mean, when I first saw that, Sam, I was like, that is the cool. I have never that such a throwback piece of equipment. That was the neatest thing I'd ever seen in a plant. Yep, boss piston stuffer. Yep, yep. Uh, good old days. Considering that we came from uh, the original sausage kitchen was my grandfather's garage, uh, I thought we'd come a long way. Yeah. What the hand crank? Where your right arm was like? I don't even think it was a hand crank. I think no? that we literally put it in a in a tube, uh, metal cast tube. You drop ah, right. the sausage in with a lever and you pushed it, and it pu pushed the sausage out the other end into a hog casing. So when we went to Piston Stuffers, man. We were as a you were uptown. Oh my, yeah, until literally the nineteen oh two early two thousands, we were still using that Piston Stuffer. Yeah. Wow, shoveling it I in. Think, I think it was about two thousand four when we brought the hot man in. Yeah. yeah, I'd been around yeah. for about four or five years when we brought that yeah. one in. And Danny, you'll appreciate this. After the fire, we we were able to actually salvage a few things. One of which was the original wooden sausage patty mold. <laughs> and wooden press, which was Sam. How old were you when you were pressing sausage patties using that? Uh. Oh, <laughs> 12, 13, 14. You take an ice cream scoop, scoop it in the sausage tub with you know, sauce ground sausage. Scoop, take your hand, level off the scoop, hit it, put it on a piece of wax paper, put another piece of wax paper on top, take the wooden handle with the patty former hit it one time there's your one patty you know you set it <laughs> in the box we could do me and a woman could do 40 pounds a day i'm Ooh. sorry 400, 400 pounds a day we could do and, and sam there may be some of that original culture still floating around on that mold yeah. that we can <laughs> i know i lost some brain cells doing that oh that was boring that's so boring sammy has his stories too he was a hand pitcher. Meaning pitching, pitcher? pitching, you know, taking hands out of combos and throwing them onto the side. Ah, right on. Got it. Got it. Got Muscle it. guy. Got it. He loved it. He absolutely loved it. <laughs> um, can you think of anything else uh, on the science end that we would be an educator, uh, an education to? I mean, I yeah, I mean, we've kind of just, that's in an, 
we haven't really talked much about drying. I mean, the 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 other preservative effect, but it kind of comes with it as we've added the salt and cure. You know, we've driven a lot of water out, and so we've this idea of and not requiring a cook step uh, in the process is pretty unique to to dry cure products because we've we've made an environment then of pulling the water out that the spoilage organisms can't can't exist, and so there's no there's no need for a thermal requirement or a thermal lethality, as we say. But, um, and that's, you know, that's, a that's, uh, it gives it different texture. I mean, because you can consume it without being cooked if it's truly dry enough. I mean, there's, let me get into that discussion a little bit. There's a fair amount of ham that's on the market that I don't necessarily that I would consider it ready to eat from a, I mean, it's, it's, Country ham kind of rides the line of, uh, or traditional retail country ham rides the line of, all right, it's shelf stable, meaning it doesn't need re refrigeration at retail, but I wouldn't necessarily consume it in that form. I would still thermally process it or cook it at home just because the quality aspect is better when you fry it in a pan or you know, if you're going to use it for yeah. bi biscuit ham. But the longer matured product that the Suriano type product that's got a lot of age on it and the water activity is quite a bit lower, um, that's a different, that's still cut your hand, but it's really a different animal. So from a from a sensory standpoint, it's going to have a much different mouthfeel and yeah. taste and all those kinds of things. Now we figured, we kind of figured that out. It took us a while to find the science to support it. Um, some of it came from Europe. Some of it came from Wisconsin. Um University of Wisconsin and um, uh, supported some somewhat by Dr. Estes Reynolds' work too, mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually had a meeting with USDA was doing some workforce in Alabama, and they immediately threw out the European science because they said it's not U.S. science. So. <laughs> So well, Dana, that we, was a conversation with the USDA in Alabama was really interesting. Not, hmm. not I'm sorry, not Alabama, Mississippi. Hmm. And uh, anyway, I had PhDs from Mississippi State step in to say, "Hey, look, it it's valid." We can but translate it. To USDA you. got yeah, USDA guy just didn't see see eye to eye on that. Well, and that's we where doing, Dana, we, we, we actually do uh, water activity testing on the Suriano since we sell the, you know, official water activity testing so we can show USDA that's yeah. low enough to be considered where with, you know, the, the 90 day ham, we, I, I, I just tell all my wholesale chefs and, and customers uh, our, our direct to consumer as well. Yeah. You got to cook a young ham. You know, it's that, that line when you get to our wigwam ham with nine to 11 months age on it. Now, since we don't, do official water activity testing on that, I'm obliged to tell my chefs that that needs to be cooked off. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've eaten a nine to 11 month age ham uncooked. I'm still sitting here talking to you today. So, you know, but no, it's, no, no. it's that fine. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that it's an issue of safety as much as it is of texture and qual. I mean, the textural quality. I mean, it, um, you know, younger ham is just a little more chewy. Um, I, I guess that's a good descriptor. Um, yeah, it just it doesn't eat as well as a dryer ham. Hey, let me ask you a question. Last question, I think. Um, would the water activity level and safety apply across species like dry cured lamb, dry cured ham, dry cured beef? I mean, theor theoretically, yes. I mean, you'd have to consider what the what the hazards are for each one of those species, and then base that target water activity based on whatever that hazard, you know, that hazard right. that is most likely to occur. Right. Right. To steal a HACCP turn. Right. But the reality is whether it's a, if we're, if we're dealing with a um, mammalian prod, raw material, right. I mean, if we're dealing with beef or we're dealing with lamb or we're dealing with pork, um, you know, we're going to have very similar concerns from a bacterial standpoint. Right, right. I mean, some, some, some 
pathogens more than others by species. But at the end of the day, the target water activity is going to be the same. Pathogens die at a certain yes. water activity, no matter what. Yes, no and most, of, most of them die at a at a in a from a standpoint in the country ham realm. Most of them die relatively early. I mean, or at least at a elevated water activity. I mean, you, you get to point nine water activity, you've you've erased a pretty significant number of pathogens on the board, or at least made it pretty difficult for them to to reproduce. They might some still might survive. Um, and the one that might survive, there's one in particular, Staphylococcus aureus is one that we worry about or that we're at least wary of in that dry cure system because they tell they can tolerate a lower water activity down to, say, maybe 0.84. But what happens is through that process of getting that product dry, you, the, the vegetative cell might survive in staph, but its ability to um, produce toxin is compromised. And that's, and that's some deeper microbiology. Not all organisms impart their pathogenicity the same way. Some are infection that where the actual, the cell creates the illness and some is it's a secondary product or a toxin that's produced. So, you know, salmonella, you want to kill the cell, right? Yeah. E. coli, you know, you want to kill the cell staff. You can have the cell, but it's really, as long as you've kept the growth in check and it's not going to produce toxin, that's the major issue because right. the consumption of the cell won't necessarily cause you. Right, and we were able to find the science to support the water activities that we're targeting to make sure that the product was safe, our Suriano, uh, at a certain water activity. We backed it up with science. So the question mm -hmm. became, did it cross across species? And we couldn't find science to prove that, yeah. lamb, that lamb was uh, and that's, uh, fit. Yeah, and a lot of that is just that the data doesn't exist for those type of, yeah. I mean, dry cured lamb, I mean, they, in the world, they make it in about three places. I mean, Iceland and some of the Scandinavian countries will do yeah. that type of right. product. And there's just not a lot of data that yeah. the regulatory agency is comfortable with looking at and going, yeah, okay, it's going to cross. We're going to be able to draw that dot from one point yeah. to another and make that yeah. validation. Well, but, well, in our case, for $50,000, we could find out. Yes, family. always, right? I mean, money yeah. fixes everything, right? It <laughs> right. fixes everything. That's well, my Dana, wife. We... As we're remodeling our house, money fixes a lot of things, right? <laughs> new floors, new paint, so, new deck, all that kind of right. stuff. Are there any other questions you guys have or any other comments you want to make, Dana? No, other than I appreciate uh, you inviting me. It's fun. No, thank you for doing this. This yeah. is great. Uh, and Sammy, don't you... drive by Raleigh on a ham tasting tour and not pick me up. <laughs> I mean, I'll buy gas. I mean, I, I'm, I'm totally not yeah. a slacker. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a good traveler. I contribute. Let's do this. Yeah, well, we've been talking about getting a, a, an official Edwards RV to to actually make these tours official, so that we can uh, go around doing the ham tasting tour cross the country. Edwards RV. Oh, that is some that is some video that is destined to go viral. I mean, that yeah, that, yeah. that a big old ham painted on the side of a bus. Yep. Absolutely. We, we're going to show deal. the we're going to show the pigs in pasture right on through the curing and the aging rooms hanging the hams and absolutely sounds with like a, a deal. snout with a snout on the grill on the on the front like on the yep. gr yeah on the front yep. grill yeah, perfect and when you and when you hit the horn you're going to hear a big snort. <laughs> Man, uh, you you need to get on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, but trust me. Ask Sammy. He knows Our, I've been searching for a while now. RV, RV Trader. I'm telling you, get on RV Trader. This I've been good. there. I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. All right, good. Well, you guys have a good weekend, and we'll um, hopefully we'll talk again. Okay. Right. Thanks, Dana. Thanks very much, Dana. Appreciate it. Have a great day, man. Take care.